All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, since this is an analytics group, we're conducting an experiment. We're doing an A-B test. How many people show up and pay attention when we provide food? How many people show up and pay attention when we don't provide food? No, uh, the food is on its way. The food is on its way, we've been assured. But rather than waiting until that gets here and then starting, we're going to go ahead and get started now. We have two uh, guest speakers. Uh, once the food does arrive, I'm sure you'll see it, and uh, feel free to get up during the talk. Uh, you'll still be able to hear it, so I think we'll be okay to be going. Uh, we have two speakers today. Um, for those who don't remember, because usually Matt does this, uh, uh, I'm Professor Runner from the Geese College of Business, uh, and we've invited two uh, people from the Geese College of Business to speak today. Uh, the first is going to be Vishal, the second will be Jose. Um, then we're going to provide a little bit different perspective on some things that are going in the college uh, that maybe sort of give you a different view of, of what campus is doing. It's not all North Campus. We're actually starting to move analytics all over campus. Uh, so without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce Vishal. Vishal uh, runs the uh, Maker Lab uh, in the East College of Business, but he also is doing a lot of analytics stuff. Uh, and so today he's going to talk to you about some of the computer data science projects that are being taken at the East College of Business. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, and uh, thank you, Matt, for this Matt. Thank you for the invitation and thank you all for joining. Uh, hopefully, I won't stand too long between food and you. Um, so, um, uh, Robert mentioned I uh, run the Maker Lab as well. So, Fridays is Maker Lab branding day, so I'm wearing my t shirt. Uh, there's food. Um, so, besides that, I have a you know, few hats uh, engaged with uh, Robert to um, the you know, Deloitte Analytics Center, I'm a fellow there, so um, this sort of community data science initiative came around when um, Robert sort of sent a call for students to get activated across campus uh, on pretty much any cutting edge tech project they wanted to get involved in and community data science was one thread as well in, in that call and we had a lot of students interested. So that's how this team came together. So I'll talk about some projects we're doing with students. Um, and then a little bit about, um, and I'm, I'm an IS guy, so information systems I teach in that space. So that's where analytics, some marketing as well. Uh, and I also run a 3D printing lab. So you know, basically I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so first off, um, actually, I have some souvenirs from the Maker Lab, I'll give that to you later. Um, so here's uh, the first sort of team we have going. Now, even though my title slide said Community Data Science at the Geese College of Business, none of these students are from the Geese College of Business, so we work across the board. Hopefully, we will get more uh, students from the Geese College of Business uh, as we go along in these projects, and you know, Robert is working on that. Uh, so stats, CS, um, uh, these were, the, you know, we picked students from a big pool of some 200 applicants for different projects. There are, uh, Jose is also working, I think Jose is also presenting on his project, which again has a student uh, team working on it. Uh, so project number one, um, which we got started with, was with United Way. Um, so United Way reached out you know, through Matt and um, wanting to do sort of a four-year review of community uh, data on health, education, uh, poverty. So uh, they, they publish this every four years. So our team got involved. Um, um, we, it's not too much of, it's not big data. It's really grunt work on data curation and uh, finding reliable sources of data that they can put together and create uh, their sort of snapshot of the community every four years uh, they've got this going. So this is more grunt work, collection, curation, and helping um, the United Way team put this together. And hopefully we want to leave them with this with a better workflow so that the next time they do it, they don't have to look through PDFs or they don't have to start searching all over again because when our team met them, you know, they were sort of in the same space that we don't know who did this last time, but we need this done again. So uh, hopefully we'll give them a process as well. Um, so some of the, of course, we are focused on student impact, so we hope to find uh, 
you know, students working with messy data with real, uh, real data with real impact. So that was uh, one, one small project we're doing. The second project, which is sort of much bigger in scope, is working with uh, MTD, the FNS, Facilities and Services on Campus, and also Vioride. Uh, now this came about when we were trying to create project number three, which I'll talk about, which is essentially a data science competition for our DEs business students. And um, so FNS is sort of the anchor for this project and they've been coordinating a multimodal transportation committee, including the city of Champaign, city of Urbana, and a couple of other stakeholders. And MTD has been uh, engaged with the community, you know, they have a, um, a pretty robust uh, API to explore their data. But each of these three stakeholders have their individual sort of challenges. MTD is looking to optimize bus you know, fleet allocation, reduce bus delays. Uh, VO Ride is number one of potentially many bike providers on campus. Um, so one is there, you know, the next one will probably be coming soon so and then there's a cap so we are has a constraint 500 bikes only you can't do any more so where do they put their bikes and fns is sick and tired of finding bikes screwed all around um, they have you know they need better capacity planning on their parking uh, racks as well and you know find a mechanism that people actually park the bikes in the designated spots because these are dockless bikes so you know we're free to leave them i, I saw one right outside the door here as well uh, FNS has a lot of data sitting in PDFs and Excel files, like uh, you know, uh, safety data for or so condition data. I have sort of a snapshot of some of the data we are looking at. So MTD ridership schedules, boarding and lighting data that they they are providing. FNS has on different building types, bike capacity. They do a bike census uh, twice a year. They have pavement condition index with GPS locations. Uh, Via ride with an NDA will give us, you know, right start, stop, and duration in GPS locations. Fortunately, through another meetup, with you know getting people across campus, we figured out that tech services actually captures uh, individual data on uh, wireless access point connections. So. As you're moving across campus, as long as you're on Illinois Net, we know the broad traffic flow in every building. And that's important to predict uh, once you know course schedule and you know uh, building type and you know uh, flow through buildings, you can predict when people will be coming out en masse out of a building and then catching a bus or getting a bike. So combine all of that data, uh, there is some open data sets uh, curated by some folks in uh, CS and Stacks. Uh, so you know, bring all this together, make a soup out of it and see how it tastes. That's our broad objective. But uh, we wanted to set this up as a, a competition for our geese business students. So that was really the incentive for this effort. And it turned out that this is a lot of data and a lot of effort to put it together. So we pushed the competition to fall, but now this team that I showed you earlier is working with us and Jose is part of the team as well to curate this data and analyze, but then put it forward for a college-wide competition, which can then be plugged into courses as well. And so get students to do this. Uh, I mean, Curation of data takes 80% of the time, as you know, most of you who work with data would appreciate that. Uh, we probably can't have students doing that in a competition for three or four days, so this project is about curation the data, curating the data, analyzing a bit, uh, and then push it forward for project number three, uh, pilot the competition in the fall, and then make it an annual competition for these students with uh, corporate uh, sponsors as well. Uh, so that is sort of our, you know, all of this has happened over the last six months, primarily from uh, and engaging with uh, students across campus. Hopefully we will get more these students involved uh, as well. Um, and I'm doing well on time. So another topic that 
Uh, I wanted to share from my own sort of interest and you know if others have interest, I'm happy to uh, chat, take questions. Uh, is uh, on the issue of, uh, so now we're talking about analytics and machine learning and AI and everybody's talking about it. So one of the topics that's of interest for me is how do we get business managers to understand the concept of uh, fairness in, you know, in algorithms. Um, computationally, if you're strong and you, you know, work with algorithms, you'll, you know, you'll have the engineers doing this, but when you get to actually deploy these systems, um, it requires uh, you know, a stronger intuition of what's really going on. And uh, I, read, I read this book by Cathy O'Neill a couple of years back. I think that was the first, first thing that sensitized me to how much uh, this is an issue. And you know, she didn't use the language around AI or machine learning. She was pretty much talking about math uh, 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 affecting uh, daily life. And uh, I don't know how many of you were uh, attending the the webcon that's going on yesterday and today on campus the web conference nobody it turns out the second author was also bestseller is actually a U of I alum and she was on campus today morning talking about exactly the number two book here I haven't read that I don't read much books anymore on medium and Twitter uh, and the third one is also um, one of the best sellers so clearly this is top of mind uh, I would say start with you know, the first one on the left, and then if you have time, go for the others. Um, and uh, a lot of the tech firms are also spending a lot of time and effort in this. Uh, uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, and IBM, and Microsoft created a partnership a year or so back. Uh, Microsoft created this FATE initiative, which stands for, any guesses? Fairness. Accountability. Uh, trust. trust. Yeah, ethics. ethics. Yeah. And this ethics works always, you know, tripped me up. I said, this is too fuzzy. It doesn't give you enough, right? How do you get deeper into this? So that's what was my um, uh, hook into this, can we get deeper into this ethics thing? And Google has created a, a ethics council last week and they dissolved it yesterday because there was a big brouhaha about, you know, they got a, some conservative guy on it and they, it wasn't representative of, you know, uh, representative enough, so that, that's what's in the news. Facebook earlier this year backed the University of Munich with seven and a half million dollars. Robert, you should be noting that. Um, on ethics of AI. Um, so, but ethics, you know, we keep talking about it's not really something that you can bite easily. So I said, okay, let's look at um, what really is fairness. So when you, when you research fairness, you'll find a list of human biases that get encoded into machines. Now there are a list of 15 or so biases. Uh, which ones do you focus on? That's, you know, uh, one of the benefits of being an academic is that you can go down any which rabbit hole you want and find some nuggets of wisdom and people will actually pay you for it. So that's why you need to do a PhD. Um, so I said, okay, so let's find something that's easier to bite. So let's look at some mathematical foundations and then try it because, you know, my job is working with students or executives and communicate those concepts. Uh, so what can we communicate to business managers that then they can understand and then speak to you know, the developers? So when you get into the math of fairness, there's still a lot of stuff going around and there are trade-offs in each of these uh, sort of concepts around uh, uh, the way to define fairness in terms of math. Now I won't go into all of these, but finally all of this digging uh, led me to uh, a tool that actually Google developed. Uh, it's called a what if tool, which allows you to essentially rank, I'm not rank, but analyze your algorithms uh, on different definitions of uh, fairness. Um, so, uh, a quick uh, quick 
sort of uh, plug for Google here. They actually did something nice, and somebody, this is their People and AI Research Group, uh, that's P-A-I-R, and they created a what if, essentially a visualization which allows you to run what if analysis on algorithms, and they have several use cases here. This particular write-up is discussing uh, a mortgage lending application and essentially trying to see what these different mathematical definitions of uh, fairness would mean when you're trying to balance uh, gender, right? So fairness in terms of gender. So clearly uh, the data set shows fewer women represented in the historical data in terms of approved loans. So how do you address that imbalance in the data set? There are, you know, four or five opinions and they explain this as a dialogue between, you know, a philosopher, an ethicist, and a mathematician, and, you know, a couple of others. And you can actually run this analysis on the tool. So this tool is actually not just for, you know, running these uh, uh, what-ifs, only for fairness. It, it, you know, it provides for uh, some of the related concepts which are... Transparency, explainability, and really accountability. Well, accountability it doesn't really do, but uh, the tool allows you to play around and understand the role of, you know, Doug, can you see how the algorithm is making decisions? Or is, you know, is, it, is it able to explain, or can you get an intuition of what's going on? Uh, and of course, accountability is more uh, a, a process rather than what, you know, the tool can do for you. So that is, uh, you know, it for my talk. Uh, I'm glad you all have did uh, have some food. Uh, open for questions, uh, if you have any. Do you have any questions for Isha? Yes, sir. Are you looking for more community projects for your students? Absolutely. So, uh, sorry, the question was, the question was, are we looking for more community projects? So the vision is that we have this, and you know, Robert has put together a structure where faculty across campus, I mean, a case is clearly a focus, but across campus who want to do these kind of experiments, find a group of students who can help work with you, and then usually try and push it out as some kind of a curricular output. So, the way this came together was students, you know, interested in community data science, we wanted to do something with impact, and we got MTD, FNS, and we arrived interested. Now this will become the source for a competition. So maybe this is a model where we start with a community partner, get a group of students together, curate the data, define the problem, then push it out to a bigger platform. So I think uh, we'd certainly love that. If I might follow up, uh, there's a great interest on campus, particularly with students, to do exactly this. What we lack is partners who come together with not just data, but questions that they have that they would like to have answers, right? So this actually started with Matt uh, and, and the group that Matt's put together and worked with United Way in particular and got, got this as a, as a project. And then Michelle had connections with uh, the SMD line, so that was the secondary thing. So, so if there was the, the mechanism by which we had projects queued up, we would be able to get students bubbled into this, either as uh, just projects or courses, just on their own, maybe <coughs> uh, data, data on uh, academics. But what we really lack is that, that engagement from the, the need side. Yes, sir. Any interesting blockchain data? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Robert has a group of students working on blockchain and trying to set up a demo platform that can then be used inside classes as well. We certainly appreciate uh, any sort of real use cases that our industry partners are interested in. You know? I mean, we are, uh, the, the entire college is pretty much reaching out to uh, community partners and corporates as well, and the research park is a great place. Uh, I mean, we're developing this for our uh, I, I information systems program as well. Uh, the entire college has an action learning program from all four years, which has just been launched and is going to scale. So there are ample opportunities for engaging in special products. Any other questions? 
the, the projects you're looking for, are you looking for very local, like Champaign County or statewide? Or? We are in no position to say no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're open to, to anything. Uh, some of the things, and, and back to your point, so, so what Michelle has described is a new effort that I'm leading, primarily within the East College of Business, but we're actually bringing in partners from around campus where we have uh, an interest in exploring the application of technology uh, to business and society. Now, we can sit here and act all smart and say that we're, we know what the, the, the right technologies and the right applications are, but I think a better op opportunity is to work with industry people so we've been reaching out. Um, a great example, BP just opened up a uh, research partner site and I already was pitching to their corporate leaders when they were here, you know, we would love to work with them on these. So, Blockchain is one of the things we're interested in. Obviously, there's lots of ways to apply blockchain into different, different things, but it would be great to partner with people. You know, I really have an interest in, in, in blockchain being applied to X, uh, and I would be willing to, to advise, uh, potentially sponsor students to be exploring these things. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me at any time. And you want to? Sorry, how are you going to do this? Are you going to go up here and throw them off? No, 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 no. <laughs> so Michelle, Michelle is going to share some uh, items from the Make the Lab. Oh, sorry. Uh, any other questions before we move on to our second speaker? All right, so our second speaker is Jose. Uh, Jose, uh, you'll see this trend. Uh, we have the Maker Lab director. We have the Market Information uh, Lab director. Uh, Jose, Jose is pretty new to our community. Uh, but, but not new to this subject. Uh, and so uh, hopefully uh, uh, you're excited about this. We'll learn a little bit about uh, financial information, financial uh, modeling, and fintech in general. So yeah, let's uh, turn it over to Jose. Thank you. Um, so I moved to, I haven't moved, I've got into Illinois in November. Uh, it's a very exciting time with all the things that are happening at uh, the College of Business. So I'm part of the Market information lab. We are hosting the finance department, uh, but as part of my effort is to expand this to other departments and other organizations, so everyone can uh, leverage the tools and databases and knowledge that we have at the lab. Uh, so we're just going to talk about the lab, a brief overview of uh, fintech and what everyone's talking about. Um, the, the research that we're doing, and something fun about AI writing and forecasting. Uh, so generally about the lab and uh, what we do, so we offer real world experience, skill training uh, to students. We have limited access to the data science and deep learning workstation. That's a workstation that is housed at the lab. So we know that we have blue water here, but for the students, and you're going to see it later, uh, having a thing that they can log in and they can think around, unplug, plug it back, uh, help them to understand how the hardware actually works. Um, We've been around for 10 years offering training in uh, all sorts of uh, financial software uh, for our students. That's a picture of the lab that you can barely see. So we've got this big, huge screen that blends three uh, monitors, so displays, which are very nice. We have uh, about 20 Bloomberg terminals. If you're not familiar with Bloomberg, it's a very fancy financial terminals that are expensive to have, and the students have access. And um, potentially any partners or anyone that is doing research with us will have access to that as well for research corporates or um, That's another, what they call the 3D lab. Something fun about this lab is the company that uh, named the room went out of uh, business during the financial crisis. So this room is available uh, for naming <laughs> if you're looking for it. Um, so background, so I'm a, a math and computer science, undergrad and computer science, um, grad degree from Loyola. There are some uh, packages that I develop, so I, I work a lot with uh, high frequency data or uh, market data. It's called that fixed data, a very obscure type of data that I don't think anyone needs to deal with that. Uh, I've done some marketing, a lot of uh, marketing research, and co-authored uh, uh, some books on marketing. This is a, this is a, a fun package on uh, U.S. 
uh, patent data. There's a lot of interesting things there um, to look at. Um, just my GitHub and more information there if you're looking for that. Um, the market lab literature for a, a fellowship program. So those are potentially things that any partners will have access to. And these are students that are highly qualified, trained, and know this software uh, that we offer uh, all the inside out. So they know Bloomberg, they know Kappa Q in terms of financial software, they know all this, Excel. So if you're looking to increase your Excel skills, they will be able to teach you all these things about shortcuts and everything. Uh, learning tracks, so this is something that we start offering. We're going to start offering this fall. And there are different sort of like package workshops uh, for about eight weeks uh, that we're starting with classes, but potentially we can offer to partners and outside people. Uh, so they're similar to Bootcamp, 12 to eight weeks. We package all these different uh, workshops into a nice presentation. We follow once a week. Uh, so that's very interesting things that are coming up. Okay, so now the interesting part is yeah, in finance. So everyone is kind of talking about what is going on. Finance and AI is going to change everything. It's going to make a lot of money. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of misrepresentation of, for, that is like a gap between what executives think that machine learning or AI is, and they go and hire and pay a lot of money for um, data scientists thinking they're going to solve all these problems and that's not the reality. So what we're going to go is an overview briefly of the market, the market metrics. Uh, so a main issue with this that they hire a data scientist is the data scientist comes to do the business of the company thinking that he's going to try to develop very fancy predictive models or some sort of things and they're there just doing like raw scripts, cleaning data and pipelines and stuff like that and then the data scientists and they're being like, oh, I'm really bored. Even I'm getting paid but did a PhD and I'm not getting all uh, what I want to out of this. So that's a very um, common misrepresentation of the things that happen in the industry. Um, but this is where the financial industry kind of have the most potential to uh, have all these pipelines or streamline a lot of the scripts or what they call uh, process optimization. It's very, it's very small, but uh, so in this, the first four, five are financial reporting. So all these things can be very good use cases for automize. So you, can, you have uh, uh, cash flow statements so you can extract that from some other source you can build reports. So all these can be automized uh, through scripts. Um, this is one of the main, uh, of what is driving some of the machine learning AI uh, industry. There are sort of like niches of where companies are going. So you have uh, new startups that are trying to do like thread your underwriting. Um, if you have hear about like Link Club or Sophie, um, so they're trying to break that credit um, offering on their credit market. Then you have other technology companies that are trying to offer new infrastructure to all their financial companies. Um, then you have uh, kind of like big technology companies that have big payment systems. Uh, uh, Apple, for example, just released their credit card or credit card. So that's one of them. And then you have regular banks and organizations that they need, they need to innovate, they need to like step up because they're taken out by this new um, company. Uh, just key the stats up regarding the industry. Um, about 80% of financial institutions have entered into fintech partnerships. So uh, financial companies know that you need to do something about this innovation. Um, increase about like 50% from uh, 1.8 billion from 2011 to 30. Um, 0.8 billion uh, just this last year. So the market, in terms of you put fintech in there, and it feels like people are going to throw money at you. Um, and most of the growth is coming from China or the um, Asian market. 
So this is a very interesting company that offers insurance in China on, on financial that is just starting to raise money and is already at one point uh, 150 billion dollars. Um, okay, so some metrics of the market on a VC investment in FinTech. I wish you can see this better. Uh, so generally what, what is happening here is all these companies uh, based in China that are somehow involved into some financial uh, area or, or things that you have a credit risk. And you have three different companies doing something in there. So you can see the potential of developing a platform or some sort of a financial tool that will impact a lot of people um, in Asia or China. And you have the regular players here in uh, Europe and the US that uh, don't see, they haven't been able to enter in this market. I think partially because of our government or you know, they prefer their own uh, companies. Uh, so all the boss about AI and credit underwriting, so you hear about this, is uh, companies that were saying that you were going to scrap your uh, like Facebook posts, and all your social media, uh, your cell phone numbers, and all these things, and they, they're going to come up and say, hey, your credit score, yes, you approve for a loan or something, uh, for people that didn't have a record. But what ended up happening is in established countries or countries that have a well solid sort of credit rating system, like the US, uh, Europe, then these type of things are not really don't really change much or don't, don't really change the, the environment or the landscape. Uh, but this may be a way to do it in uh, China, like the uh, rating system that they are implemented. Uh, Brazil or new uh, economies that don't have um, this strong kind of uh, infrastructure. Uh, so this is kind of like when, when you see this uh, Gartner reports that they have the pick of innovation and then it comes down. So I ended up being everyone thought that the solution is going to be fake tech, you're going to, uh, all these magic things are going to happen and people will start realizing now, not really, there's not much you can do, or it's very hard to do it or do it right. Uh, and maybe you can use some machine learning uh, to supplement your analytics in FinTech. So that's kind of where it's going. And if you're really good at doing, um, Machine learning and deep learning, then you probably can do something bigger. But those are a few. Yeah, so that was like an overview of the market and what's going on. Um, here is uh, my uh, team. So I have six uh, students that are working with me in two, three different projects um, related to finance and fintech. Uh, so what we did first is uh, this was my workstation, so this is my own workstation, and I let them build it for me, partially because I didn't have time. It went well, it's working. Uh, so they put it together from scratch. It has uh, two um, uh, NVIDIA P5000 GPUs, so it has a, a really, it's a very nice workstation um, that does the job just to get us. So, we get started in here and then we apply for a grant with Blue Water or PAC or something like that. What we know when we have a proof of concept that things are going well. Um, so they had a lot of fun and this was more like a, a team building, they all hang out. They had never seen, they're a computer scientist, they're never trying to build a computer. And at least they're, they don't, they're not the hardwood side, so they had a lot of fun. Um, one of the projects that we're working on is uh, training strategies where LSTMs. Uh, I wasn't sure if I should like put a question here or not, or what should I talk about. So I'm not going into much detail, but basically um, we're working with this um, data set uh, from Kaggle that it was made uh, or provided by Two Sigma during one of their competitions in 2016. Um, so what I would say about this type of project, so generally when you hear like AI or FinTech, uh, it's very hard to get a data set or to like mm -hmm. even think about a problem uh, because of, first, the data is not available. 
or you have to pull different resources and the expertise that required to build a data set that is helpful uh, is hard to do, right? And then second, you have the students there are computer scientists that necessarily don't have the knowledge or the background knowledge for finance. So you have this gap of computer scientists that know how to do neural networks but don't understand anything about uh, what features are or what the S&P 500 is. So it's very difficult to uh, do something like that. Um, so what this competition was about, uh, this was uh, in 2016, and we were getting a price of 100000 So if you haven't heard about Two Sigma, these are like the golden goose of FinTech, and kind of like deep learning predictor algorithms that no one knows what's going on in there, but they're doing magic and great returns and everything. Uh, so if you... I think Kaggle changed their data uh, kind of policies and they no longer allow you to download the data and use it for any other thing besides the competition. So they are very, getting very aggressive into uh, not letting you use it for teaching purposes. Uh, so some of these things that we're doing, uh, the code will be public, but you have to figure out how to find the data. It's like, it's, it's Gonna, it's hard. It, we cannot publish it or do anything like that. Uh, two Sigma anonymize the data, so you don't know what you're really working on. You might dummy errors, you never know, but they do all sorts of things. Uh, so we can understand that. Uh, but generally, what we know is uh, there are macro factors of the economy, how the economy is doing, industry conditions, financial conditions, revenues. Uh, so this is what I'm talking about, it's very hard to put together. So sitting down with a bunch of kind of finance producers and say, hey, let's put this together, a data set that you can go in a million ways. So what Two Sigma has is have this thing that they can, okay, let's do the, let's find all these resources and apply um, some machine learning or deep learning to have an outcome. So that's very hard. Setting out the problem, I feel like it's one of the biggest challenges. How the data looks like. So basically, you have uh, fundamental and technical features here. You have the predictor, just like a almost regular use case. So when you see this, you can say, okay, yeah, I can apply X uh, uh, neural network to this, right? Again, getting into this chain is kind of challenging. That makes sense financially. So that you're doing something that you have features that are actually mean something when you are trying to create that mean some sort of uh, yeah, fundamentals of technical features that were created by them. So that's one of the challenging parts. Same uh, concept, you know, you have uh, a set of features that you test and then you train the rest of one. Regular, normal kind of machine learning to good learning in a use case. So that's about LSDMs. So that's one project that we're working on. Um, we're trying to uh, release a code of how we're doing it uh, for people to follow or learn uh, step by step. Right. We're also working in another project that's NLP and signal generation. So there is, this was another subject that everyone was talking about. Uh, oh, news, and then you have sentiment analysis with Twitter and Bitcoin, and you can predict the stock price by doing Twitter, and uh, that's very hard to I know you're not here. So that's some other thing. Uh, I feel like NLP has evolved a lot since when everyone was talking about this. It has the same thing, curve that you see in, in Garner, like everyone was excited about it. You can do magic things uh, no longer. But the reality is that uh, the data available for um, the honest structure data available for is massive. So if you can get this right, you can actually have some signal um, that you pair that with all other signals to make a decision instead of a financial decision. Um, so yeah, so you can um, like headlines, articles, tweets, posts, all sorts of things um, to kind of generate a signal somehow. Uh, Again, it's going to require a lot of computational power, 
requires building a data set that makes sense, and that's what it will require most of the time, having this massive data set. Um, when it comes to text, then you can see the scale of how large uh, it might be. Um, but you can leverage these signals to maybe hedge some risk. So if the sentiment or, or kind of ideas around something, uh, 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 some company or some set of companies or industry are getting kind of risky, then you maybe want to get out of that position. <coughs> Very hard to see, but uh, there's like headlines, timestamp, URL, and this is kind of like a summary of uh, the news or yeah of the headline on uh, sentiment. Uh, I think one is bad, two is good. <coughs> but, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to see from there. Uh, so where you can get this sort of information, uh, so there is a, a resource that, it, that it, I'm going to talk a little bit more is earning calls, a 10K filing, so the government requires, the US government requires uh, companies to file this 10K where they're like, have all these financial things. There are, most of them are placeholders, but there is one section that they actually have to they talk about it. Right? They, they have a more, a less uh, legal kind of jargon, and that's very valuable. Uh, you have audio, so you can actually take this a step further and analyze the audio of the earnings call. Um, maybe it's something in the voice. I mean, you can detect that someone is lying, I don't know, and we'll, we'll see some, something there. Uh, this is something fun, I see, that with NLP, you can identify when an executive is, is going, or is expressing very uh, complicated ways. So when you ask me a question, instead of me being a straightforward, I like go in a very deep and kind of elaborate answer, and they find out that when this happens, uh, it was they were trying to hide something or like build up time so analysts they, they won't keep asking those questions. So that's something interesting that came out from this. This is not my research, this is just generally research in NLP. Um, with what are conference calls? So conference calls are collected all around the world, uh, different markets, different regions. Um, I think it's very interesting that they're only in English, so there is a potential for you, for anyone else to do it in some other language. Uh, uh, and, and only in Latin America, four percent of the companies have to have that burden, so you never know. Uh, so there's a, a lot of room in there. Uh, it's starting picking up uh, since 2008, so you have basically 10 years of very good earnings calls or or data collected that you can work on. Um, so this is part of a series of programs that we have developed uh, to scrape Seeking Alpha. Probably no one here is from there. You are, I don't know. You, uh, yeah, okay. So <laughs> there are no, yeah, so it's not. Um, Be polite. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you put it, to put it in perspective, each page, there are 5,500 pages, and each page has, uh, I think like, you can have 100, it, it, it has like 500,000 earning calls information in there. So to collect all this data, yeah, we have to scrape it very politely, <laughs> uh, we're working on this. Um, every day, there are at least a hundred new companies earning calls. So, and there are cycles where this build up. So, trying to build this database to do more things. Uh, but generally, we have the company name, uh, CEO. So, the newer and more recent uh, earning calls. It's easy to scrape. The CEO as it get older, they have all these funny ways. Again, the structure of the data change, and it gets harder and harder. Uh, but generally, we can pick up with very good precision. Uh, Carter, like where the year, the company stock, 
and all sorts of metrics that will be helpful later for you in a peer research. Um, so why can you do with this and what can it be done? So if they, uh, this is for an SMP, so they have been kind of very easy or sort of like, this is highly correlated with all the other things that are going on. So saying that, yeah, so you have a negative sentiment in this quarter in 2017 in the telecommunication services. I mean, it's not only, this signal is not unique from the earning calls. Something else is happening in that. Part. So in this sense, it's, it's still interesting, but also it's not really adding too much value. If this was the only source of information that you have, then this will be gold, right? Uh, knowing where it's going. But it, it gives you some signal. Uh, also, I have this, this is like a fun, so for you guys to think about it, uh, how, like, if anyone is here in audio, or wants to do research on, like, signals, I don't know how to do this. So this is, I don't know if you have here at Hermes call, but this is a recent, recent one from Ford. Motor Company, fourth quarter, 2018 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. After the question and answer session, there will be closing remarks. At this time, I would now like to turn the call over to Lynn and Tipus Tyson. Executive Director of Investor Relations. Thank you, Deirdre. Welcome, everyone, to Ford Motor Company's fourth quarter 2018 earnings call. Presenting today are Jim Hackett, our President and CEO, Bob Shanks, our Chief Financial Officer. Apple were our decision last April to phase out sedans in the U.S. Close forward looking statement. So that's where kind of like what we're dealing with. Uh, so they have to. To put you in perspective, so whoever is doing research on this, they have to, so this is happening in real time, right? So they have to process that audio in real time, make it into a transcript and then do it. But if you can process the audio in real time, then you can take away that burden of like transcript, extra time, and so on. So that's kind of fun. Also, you can see the tone of the people they're talking. Um, I think happy or sad what's going on. If that even possible to find out, I don't know. Uh, but what they what they did just from the transcripts, they sort of get some uh, overall sentiment depending on the CFO of the company. So you can compare them uh, different CFO how I, I don't know, the voice they with their the words that they use. So it's very interesting and. Uh, you can see trends, so th those are things that are happening while you look more into this. Um, so this is, I think this is depending on how many questions does the uh, CEO takes. Uh, so, so you can see like different sentiments regarding how many questions someone takes. Uh, again, this goes back to are you letting your analysts asking you questions? We're almost done. So, very interesting work done by Uber in financial modeling. Um, very surprising when I got into this thing. You never would think that Uber was going to do, I mean, Uber does everything, but financial modeling. Uh, so, in a nutshell, what they're doing is they're, instead of them going to Oracle or someone, they build their own uh, finance platform to kind of process and do things. Very interesting. Uh, typical or their own proprietary system to get insights, operations, strategies. Uh, they can predict how many rights you're going to have. Uh, so they have all this is in there. You can find it. There's a lot of fun. They have, they have videos of the things that are there doing in there. That if this is a completely separate from one you see from Uber, but it's very amazing. Uh, so Given a region, because they have so many regions, they can 
give them a budget and that region can uh, change that. More uh, stuff about Uber. Uh, this is, so it's hard to see, but this chart, if you compare this with stock, so technology companies have been dealing with a lot of kind of variance in stock. So if you compare this with a crazy stock market, it will be very similar. And they are able to predict it easily. Same thing, very cyclical stuff, and they're using new techniques that can be easily translated uh, to finance. If you think about it, uh, the flash crash, that's one of them that uh, Uber have worked on predicting these things, predicting when a major outage is going to happen, when do we need to pay attention. And here, we're 10 years now, and we're still not able to know or predict or change uh, this type of problems in the financial markets with a lot of money is in the state. And this is the end. I got one. Back to the maker lab. I mean, I'm sorry, the market lab. Um, so you're putting a lot of high tech equipment in this lab, and so I guess this is a destination, right? People are going to be coming to the lab to do this kind of work, or is the work itself something that can be exported to people's workstation laptops and you know, other stuff like that? How's that? How do you picture that working? What do you mean, people like <coughs> outside or students? Well, students. Um, well, we wanted the lab to be a place where finance is embraced, or like financial and business conversation are embraced, so we will entice them to come to there, uh, but if you're in a different department, we can also send our students to have conversations there. Uh, having the workstation or the data science workstation there is just it's easier for proximity to play around, to showcase, but it can easily go some other places. That's okay, well, I'm just wondering about accessibility. And, um, how, how limited it is in terms of how many seats there are and how much scheduling you have. Yeah, that's an issue after. Everyone, it's great that we have a lot of demand that are different departments that want to use it and a lot of students. Um, how do we scale up? That's, that's a good question. And, and part of the limitation is the data is licensed. In many cases, right? And so we're limited in how many. You mentioned Bloomberg terminals, right? 20 Bloomberg terminals, and those are only in the lab uh, because of licensing issues. Uh, so, so there are issues like that, but if there is sufficient interest and partnerships that we can build, then this is the sort of thing we can, can grow. We can easily, if there is a special data set or some sort of things that we have to build out within time, that's doable. Access to data, that's not a problem. Building data set that what we would like to have more is like, hey, I have this idea, I have this project, you have access to data and students, how do we make that happen? Access to data and the data sources is, I think, the most challenging. Outside. You probably noticed a theme today. Uh, data, partners, uh, advisors, those are always things that we talk about. Uh, all right, so let's thank our speakers one last time.